the dish that you love the most in Vietnam, but let's not say pho or bún chả because like everybody everybody can, says everybody that. Okay. Say so. so I don't know what 60,000 tons of wheat is. How many loaves of bread? Is that? <laughs> I would find it wonderful to be able to live here. My wife has a say in that too. So we'll see what happens after after I retire. Good afternoon, I'm Mr. Ambassador, and uh, welcome to the Zing News studio. Uh, you are the first guest ever to come to this studio uh, to have a live uh, interview with us today. And uh, before this interview, we have a uh, an article on Zing News, and we have a tool where, where our readers send you uh, questions, and we're going to answer, I hope, all of them uh, today. Uh, so thank you for coming with us today. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. appreciate it the invitation and uh, greetings to you and all of your listeners. Thank you. Let me start with the very first questions. Uh, and our reader is very excited because uh, they hear, they see a lot of video of you on the internet speaking Vietnamese. And they, they send a lot of questions about uh, how long does it take for you to become fluent in uh, Vietnamese and what is your secret to be able to speak uh, so many languages? Well, first of all, I would I I would not describe myself as fluent, um, but I did um, I did study uh, for about a year, back in 2004, um, before I began my assignment uh, in Hanoi. And so, at that time, um, I don't know. I think it's just uh, I had some excellent teachers, and uh, I was very fortunate to just to be able to um, interact with you know Vietnamese friends at the time and. Uh, Of course, the language, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it, as they say. And so I've, uh, when I was reassigned here recently uh, to serve again, I it took some practice. I had to actually go back to school for a couple of months just to reacquaint myself with the language because, to be honest, I had not used it. And so it really, I regretted that. And oh. so I think to your listeners, if they have, um, if they have a, a language skill, I encourage them to use it because it really, it's a living thing. You have to, you have to nurture it always in order to keep, to keep uh, able to speak it. Yeah, so uh, I guess that you have to practice it a lot. How do you discover anything when you learn the language uh, in the place you work in? Well, I was, again, I've been fortunate. I, I've served in, in, and lived in, in Seoul and in Tokyo and learned those languages as, uh, um, just by working with, with you know, colleagues who are Japanese and Korean, by interacting with them, going out and having fun with them, and expect and here in Vietnam, look forward to being able to do, to do the same. Although one of the challenges is uh, in our embassy in, in Hanoi, everyone, all of our team speaks excellent English. Oh. And so I really, um, it's a luxury. And it's, if I'm not careful, I'll get lazy and, and we'll, never, we'll never use my Vietnamese. So I have to try hard to keep it up. <laughs> so uh, uh, in your personal life, do you seek the chance to speak Vietnamese like when you go to the food shop or, uh, you know, to the sport event or something? Of course, of course. Uh, when I was here before, I always sought opportunities to speak on the outside. And this time, uh, to the extent I can, I, I hope to do the same. I've only been back a month, and but looking forward to the months and years ahead where I'll be able to get out and, and interact with uh, people of Vietnam, hopefully many of your listeners, and, and they could tell me uh, how I can make my Vietnamese even better. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh... Speaking of living in Vietnam, I, I, now I'm going to ask you a very uh, cliche question. That what is the dish that you love the most in Vietnam? But uh, let's not say pho or bún chả because like everybody, everybody every, says everybody that. Okay. Say so. Well, I love I love uh, cuốn and nem a lot. Oh, Those nice. are yeah, and uh, it's just it's such a diverse variety throughout the country of different kinds of, of rolls, nem and cuốn. That um, I really do enjoy that very much. Yeah, and I think that uh, that dish is also a very famous in your uh, your hometown, Los Angeles. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I, I was fortunate growing up in Los Angeles. I had a lot of Vietnamese American friends around me and had opportunities to uh, go to dinner and lunch at their homes. And so I was was blessed from a young age to to have exposure to to Vietnam in that way. Oh, that's that's very nice. Do you think this uh, is? Uh... Let's say fate that uh, one day you you become the ambassador in uh, Vietnam. Do you seek to uh, become the Vietnam ambassador, or were you excited uh, to this position? I absolutely sought it. I mean, this is I think for for many people uh, it would be considered a dream job um, to serve here, given how important 
the relationship between our two countries is and, and will be in the future. And so for me, this was uh, something I sought out and, and feel very fortunate that uh, and, and lucky <laughs> that things worked out as they did. Yeah. You first come to Vietnam, I believe, in Hanoi, right? Uh, how do you feel it's uh, you know, different from your hometown, Los Angeles? You know, so a lot of people aren't aware Los Angeles is quite an old city. It was founded by the Spanish back in uh, 1700s. And so uh, there, there are parts of L.A. That, that feel very old, just like in Hanoi. You can feel the history. Yes. And so I definitely noticed that about being in Hanoi. The history is around every corner. And even though, of course, the pace of development there is very rapid as it is throughout the country, um, it's, it's really, for me, the weight of history and, and the, the int intrigue of history is something that makes it very uh, appealing, very special to, to live there. Ah, uh, yeah. And you have been uh, to Vietnam for like 15 years, uh, if I recall. And I believe that you have seen so many change uh, in those 15 years. Can you tell me uh, some of the notable change uh, that you see in Vietnam in, in the last 15 years? Well, I mean, the obvious changes of, of even though, I mean, the basics of, of the city, Hanoi, are the same. A lot of the streets are the same. I mean, what's on top of the streets are very different. A lot of the, of course, new buildings, new restaurants, cafes. I mean, it's all different and growing. Um, but what hasn't changed is, I mean, just uh, how warm the Vietnamese people are and how uh -huh. warmly my family and I were welcomed. Um, that's one thing that stayed the same. Yeah. So a lot of uh, my American friends want to stay in Vietnam uh, in their retire life. You image yourself, you know, living in Vietnam after your tenure. <laughs> and, uh, That's a great question. I, I think it would be, um, I, would, I would find it wonderful to be able to live here. But um, my wife has a say in that too. So we'll see what happens after, after I retire. Yeah. And I really hope that you can enjoy your stay here in Thank Vietnam. Thank you. A lot of Vietnamese students are looking for a chance to study abroad, especially in uh, the U.S. And they, they are wondering, will the U.S. government have any policy, you know, to uh, make study in the U.S. less costly and more affordable for Vietnamese students? So one of the biggest, I think, um, regrets of, of COVID-19 around the world was kind of the freezing of foreign students yeah. traveling from country A to country B. Yes. Um, I think one of the great strengths of the United States is being able to attract uh, young people from around the world who want to study at American high schools, university, graduate programs, postdoc programs. And, you know, these, this really suffered because of the pandemic and the inability of folks to travel. Um, and so I'm hoping now that, well, you know, fingers crossed, I'm hoping that as we're moving out of the pandemic in the United States and, and around the world, that we'll be able to get back to the kind of numbers we saw before. Vietnam, of course, at 30,000 students in the United States. Um, frankly, I mean, one of my goals serving here is to try and increase that number even more, not just be satisfied with 30,000, but to bring up the number even further. And so, and, you know, recognizing that um, studying in the United States may not be for everybody, but, you know, you know there are programs in the U.S. to encourage young people uh, to study there. I mean, we have at um, the U.S. Consulate General here in Ho Chi Minh City and then also the Embassy of Hanoi, we have something, Education USA, which helps to connect uh, young people uh, with schools in the U.S. and educate them about opportunities, including financial opportunities. And so I would not, um, I, I would absolutely encourage your listeners, if they're interested, don't give up. A, a barrier for people, especially for the young people who are seeking a job or growing up, um, you know, in the U.S. Do you have any advice for those young people who, you know, trying to be seeking a study or working opportunity in the U.S.? Well, I think, uh, and, and this shouldn't come as a surprise or actually come as much of a challenge for young Vietnamese, but obviously, um, you know, working on, on language skills is very important. I know, you know, so many Vietnamese young people speak better English than I do, uh, so that shouldn't be a huge challenge. But of course, language is very important. And, and I think also just um, having an open mind about opportunities that might be out there. I think very often young people are very focused on, I want to do this, and it has to be at this school and this city and this subject. Mm -hmm. You know, if that... that certainly can work out. Um, but if it doesn't, I would not be discouraged because there's a lot of other opportunities, whether it's to study or to, or to even to work. So I would just encourage young, you know, your listeners just to have an open mind about what potential opportunities are, are available. And I believe with uh, you know, the re relationship between Vietnam and the U.S. right now, um, we're going to have a lot of opportunity for the young people. So one uh, reader is asking what three words would you use to describe the Vietnam-U.S. Uh, bilateral relationship now? So, uh, future-oriented, 
uh, wide ranging, I yes. think is another one, and optimistic. I mean, I think when you look at everything that the U.S. and Vietnam are doing, just the sheer breadth of our cooperative efforts, it ranges, you know, from from security cooperation to economic cooperation to health cooperation, uh, energy, climate, science, technology. We're even talking about space, outer space cooperation. I mean, the full range yes. of virtually every human or government endeavor we're doing together with Vietnam. And that's remarkable when you compare it to 10 or 15 years ago. Yes. And, and so that's wide ranging. Future oriented, of course, because what we do is, is, is really aiming for, for building a better relationship going forward, building an even stronger one. And, you know, looking at ways we can connect our people even more, as we talked about earlier, educational exchanges, people to people exchanges, and then optimistic. I mean, there's so much that we share in terms of our national interests, our national goals, yes. in terms of our aspirations for our own peoples and our, our children and grandchildren, that I think the U.S. and Vietnam are natural partners. And, and this is why I feel very optimistic. I think the sky's the limit when it comes to what our two countries can do together in the future. Yes, uh, I, I share your view too. But, you know, after the pandemic, and now we have uh, quite a violent uh, international situation, um, do you think that uh, any new emerging challenge between Vietnam and U.S. is rising? What can we do to, you know, address them? So I think one thing about, um, you know, countries as they get closer together, uh, interestingly, perhaps ironically, but the closer two countries get very often, the more challenges they end up having to face together and sometimes even frictions that they, they have to uh, work out together. You know, I mean, I've, I, I worked um, on issues related to Japan and South Korea for many, many years, almost 20 years, two of our closest allies, I'd say our closest allies in the world. Yet the amount of time we spent dealing with challenges and, and sometimes frictions and, and obstacles, it was a lot because I think is, you know, when you get close to someone, there's just a lot of things you have to work out. And so I'm, I'm going to predict that as US, Vietnam, United States and Vietnam get closer and closer, we're going to have more and more things we have to work on together because that's just the nature of close friendships and partnerships. Yes. Um, do you have any uh, specific area of uh, bilateral relation that you want to devote? Well, I mean, uh, as I mentioned earlier, absolutely educational exchanges and people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, Secretary, so Special Representative uh, for Climate, John Kerry, was here last week, as you know. Yes. And, um, you know, it, it's very clear to me that climate cooperation is going to be a very important feature of our two countries' ties. And this is something that I, I want to devote myself to as well. I think it's, you know, we're talking about the future of our planet. And uh, it seems to me a natural area for cooperation between the U.S. and, and, and Vietnam. Um, there's a lot we can do and, and there's a lot we can provide, whether it's financial assistance, technical assistance, human resources assistance. Yes. And so we're prepared to do that. And, and John Kerry's visit was just the next step after... Uh, COP26 in Glasgow, which your prime minister made a very bold yeah. announcement about Vietnam's commitment. Um, but there's a lot of work to do, and we can't wait 15 years. We have to start now. And so this is something I'd like to work on. And I think also uh, just deepening our economic ties, trade ties, of course, and ensuring American companies are able to do business here in a manner that's fair and a level playing field. And I would love to see more Vietnamese businesses going to the United States, uh, investing in the United States. I yes. think um, more and more, I, I hope that we can have great Vietnamese companies uh, present in the U.S. and helping to create good jobs for American workers. And so that's another thing I, I'd like to, to focus on as well. Yeah, and trade and economic is also a area that I read uh, very, uh, take very, very interesting. In. How can Vietnam and the U.S. You know, do better to help improve our trade uh, relations? What are the, the main barriers that we need to tackle now? You know, our government counterparts, um, concerns about sort of the regulatory environment here, tax environment here, and, and these are all things that come up when businesses, you know, try to do business in other countries. But you know, we'll always address these issues in a way that's respectful, but also in a way that's very frank. Um, and we will work very closely with our business community to yes. to raise concerns that we have. Um, but the, the goal is ultimately to create an environment here that assists not just American companies and American workers, but also hopefully Vietnamese consumers and Vietnamese companies. And in, in, with the ultimate goal, we hope, of, of raising prosperity uh, yeah. in both countries. Recently, Vietnam eliminated 
about uh, the three percent U.S. wheat import tariff late uh, last year. Yeah, and in early uh, February, the first shipment of uh, tariff free of wheat uh, had arrived to Vietnam, carrying about sixty thousand ton. What What are your talk about this? I think that's great. Um, I'm I'm not an agricultural expert, so sixty thousand tons. I don't know what. 60,000 tons of wheat is, how many loaves of bread is that? <laughs> But it sounds like a lot. And I think it's great. I, I, would, love, I would love for the United States to be a source of, of food uh, and, and foodstuffs um, for Vietnam. I think it would be wonderful for us to even deepen further um, our cooperation on food security and to make the United States the seller of choice when it comes to not just grains like wheat, but also uh, meats like beef and pork. Uh, fruits and vegetables; these are all great American products that I think Vietnamese consumers would would love to have on their tables. And uh, the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy uh, it is very uh, comprehensive, but uh, some said that it lacks the clear direction on this economic uh, policy for the area. Uh, we will see more, you know, economic engagement uh, for the U.S. to the Indo-Pacific uh, era. Uh, can we expect a revival of TPP or in some form? Well, what you can expect to see in the weeks and months ahead is. Uh, the release of, of what we call, it's the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, um, which is, is meant to to really address the, the kinds of subjects that aren't necessarily contained in a traditional trade agreement. So uh, the IPEF, as we call it, um, will, for example, look at things like digital economy. It will look at things like supply chain resilience. It will look at things uh, like uh, climate resilience. Um, so, and we've been consulting uh, with governments in the region, including yours. Uh, we've been consulting with members of the business community to try and make this the most uh, effective and useful um, framework that we can. You know, recognizing that um, U.S. engagement in the region uh, is not just about security, but it's about trade and investment. I mean, the United States private sector has one trillion dollars of investment in the Indo-Pacific. One trillion, and so. People who say like, oh, the U.S. is not engaged economically, that's completely, that's nonsense. We are very engaged economically. But we as a government recognize that we need to ensure that what we do here um, is part of a larger strategy of engaging uh, with the region. And so that's what the Indo-Pacific strategy and the Indo-Pacific economic framework are meant to address. Uh, I see. I think that the U.S. and, uh, the, and Vietnam has a many similar approach to the a future economic uh, one what is the green business and uh, uh, as you said uh, at the last uh, special envoy of uh, Mr. John Kerry trip to Vietnam he said that Vietnam need to move for, further away from cold energy and how can Vietnam attract a green finance from the US and other countries so this is a great question because um, as as special representative Kerry said during his his visit last week there are You know, some of the most well-known, largest American companies, banks, um, they're all eager to do business in countries that have a, pr have a track record of uh, using uh, fully uh, green energy. Uh, you know, they don't want um, to come in and invest a billion dollars in a factory that's drawing its energy from coal. And, and so, as Special Representative Kerry explained, he was in contact with, with banks, with big companies, And they're all very eager to do business in a place like Vietnam, which sits on a wealth of green energy potential, whether it's uh, wind power, onshore wind power, offshore wind power, whether it's solar. I mean, Vietnam's 3,000-kilometer coastline provides so many opportunities for green energy. And so to make that transition from coal to renewables, uh, you know, recognizing you can't do it overnight, but that Vietnam is better placed than most countries to be able to do this. Um, especially because Vietnam imports all of its coal. It's not like it has to worry about closing down coal mines and putting people out of work. And so it's, it's, it's an important uh, decision that your government made at Glasgow, and now it's the follow-up, the implementation that is equally important. And this is where not just the U.S., but the international community, the World Bank, and other organizations, we're all eager, we're all ready to help, to help Vietnam make that transition because it's... It's really, it's not just for the sake of, of Vietnam, but also of, of the world. And, and we learned about um, what's happening in the Mekong Delta right now between rising sea levels, but then, incre and, but then decreased water flow, causing increased salination of the river. It's, it's harming farmers and fishermen um, along the riverbanks. And so this is, uh, 
I'm sure your listeners who are in this area, it it's, hits them very hard every day in, in where they live. You know, I don't, I'm not an expert on, on this, and my education is still <laughs> still evolving, but as far as I know, one of the issues along the river is just the number of dams yes. that are upstream starting starting in, in China and, and moving down. And so yes. with these dams, which do provide very important hydroelectric power, um, yes. there's no doubt, but, but how can we, is there a way to transfer you know, from hydroelectric power in these dams to something that's greener, whether it's um, whether it's solar or whether it's wind power, yes. to allow the river to flow more strongly, more regularly, to help just sort of clean out the silt and and push back on the salt water that's that's intruding from from the ocean. Yes, I think uh, the two countries uh, have a lot to do together you know, to Absolutely. prevent these uh, disaster. And while we talk about the people to people uh, change, um, one of our reader asking about. Uh, how do you evaluate the people-to-people tie between both countries, and what could be done more? Okay. You know, we have two great people-to-people resources. One is the number of Vietnamese students pre-COVID who were studying in the United States um, at thirty thousand. That was the sixth. Vietnam was the sixth largest country sending students to the U.S. after places like India and China. I mean. And for Vietnam to be six, I think, is remarkable. That's a that's a really significant achievement. So that's one resource. And another resource for people-to-people ties, of course, is the two million-plus Vietnamese Americans uh, who reside in the United States and who, um, you know, still have, in some cases, a family here or seek to, to do business here. Or, But, but you know, these two, um, how can I say, just sort of precious resources are, enable our two countries, I think, to to build better sort of bridges and foundations between us to to further develop people-to-people ties. But one thing I think is lacking is, of course, pre-COVID, we had many Americans came to travel to Vietnam, I think 700,000, 750,000, uh, you know, 20, whenever it was, uh, 19. Um, and hopefully that those number of American tourists will will go up again. But I would love to see more American young people come here to Vietnam to, to study, to teach English, um, and so I can't speak on behalf of the Vietnamese government, but there are, for example, if you look at Japan, Japan has a great program called JET to bring over young Americans to teach English um, in Japan. And it's a great way to build bridges and, and mutual understanding. And I think if Vietnam were to have a, a, a version of that where young Americans could come here, I think you'd have a line a mile long of Americans who'd want to come and participate in that program. That's, that's really nice to hear. I think education is... a a bridge where we should, we we could cross very easily to uh, you know close up the relationship between two country. However, um, uh, how can our two country you know strengthen cooperation in in this education field, especially after the the, the pandemic? It is, and I know that I mean we've got a great uh, we've got a great program here uh, here in Ho Chi Minh City, the the Fulbright University of Vietnam, which does great work in in providing a you know, American style liberal arts education for young for young Vietnamese. Um, and I know they have plans to expand, which is very exciting. And I know they have uh, exchange programs with other universities, like I think Dartmouth University perhaps is one. And so I think we could need to look for more opportunities like that to to build bridges between educational institutions here in Vietnam and, and in the United States and allowing young people to go back and forth and take advantage of educational resources in, in each country. And so uh, after you know, staying here for 15 uh, years and do a lot of work uh, between two nations, uh, what, what piece of the U.S. history do you want the Vietnamese people to know more about? And vice versa, what story of Vietnam do you think that the U.S. Uh, people need to know more? You know? Wow, that's a good question. Um, the period sort of after World War II, um, the popular image in the United States is of people living happily together and America was prospering and, and the middle class was thriving. And on the surface, that's all true. But in fact, there was a lot of, there were a lot of problems under the surface that uh, people chose not to pay attention to. Um, problems related to, to race, problems related to gender, um, and many others. Problems related to sexual orientation and people just chose not to, um, chose to ignore these, 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 Basically, it was discrimination that these a lot of groups were facing, and so, and a lot of this finally came out in the '60s. You saw, you know, civil rights movement, you saw women's rights movement, you saw 
you know, other efforts to sort of make America a better, a better place. And this took a lot of courage. A lot of people went out in the streets and protested, and um, it was very divisive. But in the end, I think our, our country became stronger because of it. So I think, uh, you know, we, we are not a perfect country at all, as we've seen um, just in the last couple of years with the murder of George Floyd. We saw, once again, that racism and discrimination in our country are not... Um, are not complete, are not, are not, you know, solved. These are ongoing conversations we have to have that we have problems. I, th I hope we recognize that we have problems, and I hope that people will continue, continually try to do what we call make a more perfect union, to try and create a, a, an America that's better and lives up to our ideals, because um, we often fall short, but we, we try to recognize that we fall short. We're not perfect. What part of Vietnam history I would like Americans to learn? Maybe um, not history, maybe just a story, uh, economy, well, uh, social story. So very often p people say that there's a saying, I don't know, if, you know, Vietnam is a country and not just a war. That, you know, I think the image of a lot of Americans they have is about the war between our two countries, when in fact Vietnam has a rich history and a rich culture that goes back more than a thousand years, two thousand years. And I, I wish Americans would, would know that part of Vietnam, that it's, you know, even though... Our two countries share a, a very tragic history. There is so much more to Vietnam's story than just that history between the U.S. and, and ourselves in that period of time. And yeah. I hope that as you know, we move forward, we're going to continue to write a history um, that's that's optimistic and forward-looking. Um, and I think you know we're we're very capable of doing it. And uh, as as we are talking, it is now confirmed that our Prime Minister Phạm Minh Chính visits in the U.S. And how, how do you make of this news? What do you think will be the priority of the trip? And Again, can you see the prosperity of uh, the Vietnam-U.S. relation as a strategic partnership closer? Well, first of all, I mean, our, our goal, uh, is, is Vice President Harris said last year, and as we've said in other, other forums, that you know, our goal is to raise our partnership from a comprehensive one to a strategic one. And we think, I mean, all the, all the signs are there. We think that it's, it's time to do this. We feel that um, we're at the stage where Our two countries are, are already doing so much together uh, that we, you know, we're hopeful that somehow, we, you know, we can find the the way, the right way to do it um, over the next over the next year. And certainly, I'm committed to that. Uh, and we're very excited that we're going to we're going to host the uh, the ASEAN summit at the end of the month. Um, as as many of you and your listeners may be aware, this was originally planned for the spring of 2020. 20, yeah, you know, I think 20, 20. and so it's been a long time coming. Two years. Um, but the fact that, you know, we've been trying, we continue to try to do it is a reflection of really the, the importance the U.S. places on ASEAN and the centrality of ASEAN in the Indo-Pacific. And so we're very excited your prime minister is going. Um, and I think we're still trying to nail down some, some details about, about the program, but it's going to be a very exciting opportunity for your prime minister and, and, uh, to visit the U.S. and, and, uh, It'll be, I think, very meaningful in, in the history of, of high-level diplomacy between our two countries. One of the things that the Vietnamese people want to know the most is the, uh, the approach of the U.S. defense and security in, in, in Vietnam. And uh, here we have a question that according to the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, the Biden administration is going to expand the U.S. Coast Guard presence and cooperation in Southeast Asia. And with a focus of advising, training, deployment, and you know, capacity building. So, could you give us more info about this? Will be any more transfer of Coast Guard cutter from the U.S. to Vietnam? Well, in terms of this very specific uh, transfer of cutters, there's I, I don't have anything I can announce today. But I think just in, in more in more general terms, the the broader cooperation that we're pursuing between our country and yours in, in the case of the Coast Guard and, and the Vietnamese. Um, Vietnamese Coast Guard and Navy is, is you know, we strongly believe that Vietnam um, should have the ability to protect its, its sovereignty, to be able to defend its independence. Um, we strongly believe, you know, that Vietnam needs to be able to uh, patrol effectively its own waters in order to promote its own prosperity. And so this is a message Um, that we hope to transmit when we do pursue these cooperative efforts. It's all about our commitment to a Vietnam that's, that's independent, prosperous, sovereign, in control of its own resources. And so we'll continue to do this because, um, well, it's the right thing to do, first of all, and because um, 
you know, we feel this is a really good area for deepening even further our cooperation. Yes. Um, some said that given the current uh, global environment, Vietnam, we need to diversify where it buys, you know, military equipment from. We will soon see the U.S. Vietnam arms sales or more transfer of uh, military equipment. I think if if there are opportunities to do that, I know that there are a lot of uh, American companies uh, who would welcome the opportunity to do business in that area with Vietnam as, as a government. We certainly would as well. We'd support it. Uh, yes. And obviously, it depends on th- the specific need that Vietnam is looking to fill, as well as the you know the capability and and what capability say a U.S. Um, defense item might have. But uh, you know, we would love to be uh, that kind of. De- partner of choice for you as you look at um, look at you know things to procure things to purchase in terms of defense defense items yeah there is now a concern that great power competition could could uh, affect the security and stability of uh, the region especially in the south china sea and how can great power like the us you know compete with their geopad in the existing stable st- security structure well i mean our Our goal is articulated in the Indo-Pacific strategy and, and by the Biden administration more broadly is, you know, we want an agenda that's that's positive. I mean, our agenda is is not looking to um, sort of compete over territory or, or resources. Our, our agenda is one in which we identify and work with countries with whom we share interests and goals, whether it's freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight, Uh, freedom from coercion, you know, the ability to to exp- to take care of resources in one's own waters and, and in one's land. Um, this is a positive agenda. This isn't, you know, we're not out, we're not against something here. We're we're for something, and and so in the Indo-Pacific strategy, we've articulated uh, our five sort of uh, five um, essential elements of it, which include, you know, free and open Indo-Pacific. It includes deepening collaboration among. Uh, the United States and not just countries in the region, but organizations like ASEAN. Um, we're looking to promote prosperity. We're looking to promote security. We're looking to promote resilience, whether it's resilience against climate or or resilience against, heaven forbid, you know, the next pandemic. So these yes. are all es- essential elements of a positive agenda. It's not what we stand against, but it's what we stand for. And we see so many things that the U.S. and Vietnam stand for together that this is why we see Vietnam as really essential central key part of, of the of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Yeah. We have a very uh, strange question here. When will we welcome another visit by the U.S. aircraft carrier? Um, can't say. Um, you know, those things are, are scheduled way in advance, and there's a lot of different factors that go into those. Um, but I know that given the warm welcome previous visits enjoyed, I'm, I'm sure that... You know, you know, I would love to see one happen while I'm here, um, but I, yeah, there's nothing I can say at this moment. Okay. Uh, asking that, uh, what should Vietnam do to, you know, to avoid being torn between superpowers? Are the conflict right now in Ukraine, you know, affect the U.S. ability to commit to the Indo-Pacific? It's the answer to that, the simple answer to that second question is absolutely not. That um, the United States um, recognizes the Indo-Pacific is central to our security, central to our prosperity, central to um, the ability of, of our nation to thrive. And so you know, even though, of course, we have responsibilities around the world, um, the ability to, to remain an active uh, member of the Indo-Pacific, because we are, we are an Indo-Pacific power, from prosperity, security, stability, these are all things the United States brings to the region with our presence, and that's not going to change. Yeah, I think that Arita is very happy to hear that. Back to the pandemic. Uh, recently, the U.S. had listed Vietnam as the do not travel country due to the high level of uh, COVID-19. How can Vietnam work with the U.S. You know, for to delist this? So, uh, this isn't. This was not meant to target Vietnam in any way. Yes. If uh, you look at the countries around the world that are at the same level, I'd say the majority of countries around the world are at the same level of Vietnam, and it's just this is a mere reflection of the facts on the ground in terms of. Um, sort of the spread of the of the disease. It goes up, it goes down. Over the course of this, I think Vietnam has moved up and down. I know other countries I worked on, Japan, Korea has gone up, it's gone down. Yes. It's and it's not meant to be a it's not a judgment of any kind. It's really just a reflection of the facts. And as Vietnam we hope uh, moves through this this current wave, um, it'll naturally just go back down again. So 
Yeah, but but do you think that I mean why this list is going to affect the people to people at change between the two countries? Uh, I certainly hope not, because you'll you'll see. I think the actual wording of it is like, you know, if you haven't been vaccinated, you know, think twice. But considering that you know many Americans have been vaccinated, um, you know, I'm hoping it won't it won't affect those kind of certainly not medium to long term people to people exchanges. Maybe in the short term, but nothing that's going to have any lasting impact. Yeah. Um, a lot of Vietnamese people has been protected by the uh, vaccine back in the U.S. or donated uh, by the U.S. government. So, do you think uh, healthcare and health in general uh, will be a new direction for our two countries to cooperate? Well, I'm I I consider health cooperation to be a real pillar of our two countries' relationship, and but it's hardly new. If you look at our cooperation since 2004 or five, when we were working together on HIV. And then we added to that working together on TB, tuberculosis. And then, of course, most recently with COVID-19. So we have a long history of cooperating in the health field. And the, the, the great connections that we built working on the HIV epidemic helped us to do a better job with, with COVID. And so I fully expect that that relationship, that cooperative um, spirit, Uh, in in the health field was just going to continue. I think it's going to get even deeper um, in the time ahead. Yes, that's right. So I I don't know why, but one reader really really loved your your pet at home, your dog. <laughs> They asking you, <laughs> can you tell uh, tell them more about your dog? You know, so is she, that a girl, a boy? Uh, yes, the name thank you. Okay, so she, her her name is Kiba, K yes. K I B A. Uh, she's a she, yeah, and she is a Japanese dog, a Shiba Inu, but she's actually a mini. She's known as a mini Shiba Inu, so she's a little smaller than normal. Yeah. Um, but Kiba in Japanese means fang. Um, uh, so, see. but yeah, she's she's uh, she's a great little dog. She's about six years old. Um, but in some ways, she's like a cat. I think. She... <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. I hope the reader had uh, satisfied with uh, <laughs> that answer. Well, we'll do a bit. We'll try to do better and then put pictures of Kiba up on on our Facebook page or something. Yeah. So I think the time is up now. And uh, do you have any uh, other words that you want to say to our reader? Well, first of all, th thanks everybody for for reading, for listening. Um, it's I'm so impressed with with the studio here and the effort that Zing Thank is you. doing, and I'm really happy to be able to interact with you and and look forward to future opportunities uh, going forward. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abasaro, and hope to see you again. Uh, Thank you very much. In this studio of Zing, you. Thank you. Thank you.